Wow. Thank you so much for the spirit of the Lord in your singing. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Wow. Now we got to listen to this second rate preacher. Yeah. <laughs> what a tough act to follow. I'm so glad you're here. Today I want to talk about the mere truth about you. And to get us there, I want you to think about a mirror. So I'm just curious, how many of you have a mirror with you right now? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Yeah. The power of a mirror has the ability to tell the truth about you, the truth about your face, about your hair, and about your body. Now, you know the reason why I asked if you had a mirror with you and you noticed that there were no guys or maybe one or two who raised their hands. <laughs> it's because a guy looks at himself in the mirror first thing in the morning and he's finished and it's downhill from there the rest of the day. <laughs> and what you see is what you get. That's right. It's not getting any better. It just goes downhill all the way. But ladies, on the other hand, you're different. You look at yourself in the morning and you have options. <laughs> you have a toolbox. <laughs> and that's when you pull out your toolbox. And you start going to work. And when you look in the mirror, it tells the truth about every line, about every wrinkle. It does for every one of us, every blemish. Uh, every gray hair, every missing hair, every unibrow, go on and, and on. It's all in the mirror. The truth of yourself is how you look is told by the mirror. And you can't argue with it. It's a reflection of me, of you. The mirror will just tell you what is there. You know, mirrors and scales are kind of like that, aren't they? They just tell us what is really there. I mean, look at your driver's license. Just recently, in, last week, in fact, Carmen and I, we went to the DMV. We found the DMV in Kate and uh, needed to make the change of address in case we get stopped. You know, we don't have to spend five minutes explaining, well, I lived over here, lived over here, now I'm here. Really? You know, don't want to get into that discussion. And uh, uh, so we made the change of address. And I discovered that my weight was different than what was listed on my driver's license. <laughs> you know why? Because they don't have any scales at the DMV. No. You get to say whatever you want. You get to choose whatever you want, weight, whatever. You put it in there. Dovetailing off of that, as I unpack this this morning, we have the capacity to deceive ourselves, don't we? We seek to know the truth about ourselves, with scales and mirrors, and we have the ability to deceive ourselves. When we seek the truth, sometimes we resist the truth as well, and we resist the truth about ourselves. In fact, there's a truth that we, about us that we don't even know, and that's true for each of us, and that's what I would call blind spots. You know, we all have blind spots, don't we? They don't just occur in your in your a mirror in the sides of your vehicle, but we have blind spots. What is a blind spot? A blind spot is what other people talk about you when you are not there or in the room. Yeah. See, other people see our blind spots. We fail to see them. Have you ever had a moment where you actually saw a blind spot or someone pointed it out to you and you said, whoa, I do that? I did that in public. I said that publicly. To illustrate that, several years ago when Carmen and I lived in Jackson for, for 11 years, one of my favorite authors came to town by invitation. I had sponsored a, a conference for ministers and laity at, to be held at the Osage Center. And the keynote speaker was Dale Burke from Fullerton, California, who succeeded uh, as teaching pastor at the First Evangelical Free, where Chuck Swindoll retired. Dale Burke was a fantastic teacher, and I'd met him in Chicago and invited him to come and, 
And uh, I volunteered along with a long uh, list of other speakers and workshops that were put together. I volunteered to pick him up at the airport and bring him to Cape to be held at the Osage Center and also to take him back and forth to his hotel room. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I can learn some stuff from him. You know, sure, I know I can. I, I, you know, he's a great guy. And uh, I was so nervous. And Carmen, at the end of the day, she asked me, she said, Barry, did, did you learn a lot of things from Dale? And uh, I said, uh, I, I got this sick feeling in my stomach. I said, uh, Carmen, I think I talked about 75% of the time. And she said, and I, I went on, I said, I didn't ask any questions. And she said, Barry, you need to be more self-aware uh, uh, than that, and you should apologize. So the next morning when I w went to the hotel and I picked up Dale Burke, and uh, he was ready for the day to give his presentation, and I, and I said, Dale, I'm sorry. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I owe you an apology. I realized that I talked yesterday about 75% of the time. And he said, no, you didn't. And I said, I didn't? He said, you talked about 95% of the time. <laughs> you see, blind spots are all around us. We don't even know they're there. I don't know they're there. When someone is a big talker, they don't even know that they're dominating the room, that they're filling in sentences. I'm a professional, and wow, it gets me when people want to talk for me, when I, I feel like I've got a few words to say myself and invading personal space when someone finishes their your sentences for you you know that there there are blind spots other people have a way of dropping names in conversations oh i know so and so and and the reason they're doing this is they don't know they have blind spots john ortberg said that the truth about you is that you don't know the truth about you. And I, I, that is profound. This is so simple. This, is, this message, as we unpack it, is so simple for us that we could easily trip over it and miss it. And I don't want you to do so. So my task this morning is daunting. So before we talk about the truth about you, let's talk about the truth about God. When we understand, ladies and gentlemen, the truth about God, that's where we find the truth about us. He said, I have searched you and known you. The all-knowing presence and everywhere presence of God. And if you're taking notes, you might want to add these three things. The first truth you need to know about God is that God knows you. And secondly, God pursues you. And thirdly, God has a plan for you. Very simply and straight up and straightforward for you. You see, first of all, God knows you. As the psalmist found out, it was a song of celebration that wherever he went, God knew him and he knew every detail of his life. That God could be far from him, but yet he was near with him. That's, that's hard to, to uh, comprehend. And sometimes we, the most overused phrase that we have in our culture today is, nobody understands me. Yes, someone understands you, Almighty God. He knows every dream, every desire. He knows every fear, every frustration. He knows all your habits. He knows all your hang-ups. He knows your beauty marks and your warts, too. He knows everything about you. God knows you better than you know yourself. You see, the outer you that we put in front of the mirror and onto the scales is what everybody sees. It gets all dressed up and applauded and whistled at and ignored, and the inner you is invisible. The inner you is always free to choose. The outer you is measured and laughed and weighed and chemically analyzed. The inner you has a unity and a mystery that's really staggering. The outer you is temporary, but the inner you is eternal forevermore. Jesus communicated this truth that he knew us well when he said, even the very hairs on your head are numbered by God. Isn't it interesting how weight starts shifting from the poles of the body toward the equator? Hair will stop growing where you want it to and boldly go to places no hair has gone before. 
And I'm looking, no. <laughs> At some deep preconscious level, you're thinking this will never happen to me. For years, I thought I would never have a, a bald spot. But as I take another mirror and stand in front of a mirror with my back, I see it there. And I'm thinking, whenever I turn around, people see that. That will never happen to me. But it will happen to all of us. In our culture, when you realize and recognize or notice that someone you love has gotten a haircut, let me give you a little tip here. It's a sign of love. In our culture, when you fail to notice that your spouse has gotten a haircut, you know what they call that? You're sleeping on the couch. You know, I think hairstylists should send a text when the wife, the spouse, leaves the, the beauty salon and send a text to the hu husbands and let them know in advance, you know, this would be a great Shark Tank idea, don't you think? You know? When you notice something about someone, it's a demonstration of love. It really is. Jesus communicated that every hair that falls from your head Jesus didn't say that God would replace them. He just said that he notices them. That's all. He knows all about you. He's attentive to the smallest details of your life. The smallest details aren't insignificant to him. The things that you're going through, other people aren't interested in, may not be interested in, but God is interested in those small details. God knows when you feel overwhelmed at work. He knows when you feel undervalued. He knows when you feel anxious. He knows when you feel vulnerable. He knows when you feel abandoned and alone. He knows every thought that goes through your mind. That one right there. He knew it. And take heart. The one who knows you best loves you the most. Verse 5 says, you go before me and follow me in your place and your hand of blessing on my head. I love that, that phrase, the hand of blessing on my head. It goes back to the Old Testament where fathers would often place their hand on the head or the shoulder of their son and give them a blessing. You know, the power of blessing, that's another sermon for another time to talk about that. But I have known children coming from good parents who have lived in their 40s and 50s and 60s, still working and striving to get the blessing from their dad or their mother or one of the parents that failed to tell them that they loved them, just to give them that hand of blessing. Parents, listen to me, and grandparents, every child needs a hand placed on their head, symbolically, metaphorically, on their shoulder, and say, I bless you and I affirm you for who you are or else they're going to search the rest of their life trying to get that blessing, and they may do acceptable behavior, they may do inappropriate behavior in order to provoke the blessing from you. Verses 7 through 10 says that God pursues us. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. And if I go to heaven, you are there. If I go to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the mor uh, morning, if I dwell my farthest oceans, even there, your hand, Lord, will guide me and your strength will support me. Are you aware that there is no place that you can go where God isn't? That's a great reminder. It may have been weeks or days or months since you've thought about checking in with God. But not a moment has passed that he hasn't been thinking about you. You know, this, this year has been a tumultuous year as we closed out a successful pastorate in Dexter, Missouri. We felt God was leading, and I am so happy that a, a younger man who has dark hair and has a young wife and has a three-year-old son and uh, like a 18, 19-month-old baby in the pastorate there, transitioning to here and then hooking up with Pastor Dave. And, and guess what? He just in, your pastor, he just insults me right off the bat. He said, well, said, uh, the first time I've ever had an associate that's older than me. <laughs> <laughs> 
you can tell I'm really hurt by that, can't you? Wow. But I get to work with you and Nick and we have we and Jessica and Andy and Pastor Dave. We've got a fantastic team and we're gonna have a blast. We're gonna but we're gonna need your help. You see, you can't pay enough people to do the work of the ministry. But we're supposed to come up with a few ideas now and then, but you're going to be part of that ministry. And many of you are already on board and you're looking forward to it. And I, I'm just so excited. The synergy that, that is here and we've made the transition. And uh, uh, wow, just, just last week we learned how to open the garage door, you know. So, <laughs> so we, we've got a lot to learn. I don't know what that has to do with the sermon, but, but it didn't hurt you at all. Uh, you can ignore God's presence, but you can't escape, escape his pursuit of you. Let me say that again. You can ignore God's presence, but you cannot escape his pursuit of you. God's pursuing you even when you're at your worst. Even in your rebellion, God is pursuing you. Even in those moments of anger, God is pursuing you. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost, and he's in an all-out rescue mission. And it doesn't mean those who have, just those who have not made a profession of faith, but sometimes as God's people, as Christ followers, we lose our way, don't we? I've lost my way. I'll admit it. I don't know about anyone else, but I'll admit that I've lost my way, and God came to my rescue. And as a follower of Jesus, sometimes we become spiritually unresolved. But God never stops pursuing us. And why does he pursue you? You need to figure out why he's chasing you. And when you figure out why he's chasing you, then you'll know how to appropriately respond to, you, to him. You see, when we get confused about why someone pursues us, it's revealed in our response. We live in a difficult, tumultuous world where anxiety is high. Every day is new. We're not sure what is happening and going on. And most people I have learned in my life are very basically insecure. That's right. And so we need to come alongside and give a high five, a, a fist pump, and psh, a splash, and 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 you know and say I care about you and I love you and I just want to remind you that uh, you know God's in control of this world that we live I sense that there are some of you here today who need to hear those words that he is with you and he promised in the Great Commission he said go you therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And listen closely, always, always, I will be with you to the eons of time. He's with you, ladies and gentlemen. He'll see you through. I know. I won't tell you about my personal struggles in my life and what Carmen and I have been through, but we've just we've seen just about everything, had it said about us, done to us. You name it, but by the grace of God, we are standing on our feet because God is in control. And is it okay if I ask the Methodist Church, say amen? Amen. amen? amen. All right. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for what you have promised. As we look at you, you are the mirror for our lives and the mirror truth. And I pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If at any time you have questions concerning baptism, membership, a closer walk about developing your personal life, I think that's key. That sets up the spiritual life as well that you grow personally. Then contact Pastor Dave, myself, or any of our staff, and we'll be happy to, to go on a personal journey with you.